Hi everyone, this is Natalie from 1301. Today we'll be going over Big O, what it is, and how to tell what the Big O of some code is. First of all, Big O is how we measure how efficient code is. And we write it in terms of some integer n that represents the input into our code. In this class, we will focus on worst case time complexity, meaning that we want to know how the number of steps it will take for our code to run to completion grows as our input n grows larger. Essentially, Big O is a way to measure growth. Let's talk in terms of looping. If we have a file with nested loops that iterates through some code n times, how many more steps in relation to n will Python have to go through when n is 3 versus when n is 10 million? This is where big O comes in handy. When you're processing big data sets, you want to make sure your code is as efficient as possible. Otherwise, doing calculations that should take 3 minutes could end up running for 3 hours if the code has unnecessary iterations. So let's start with the most common big O. From least to greatest, they are O of 1, O of log n, O of n, O of n log n, and O of n squared. Let's start with O of 1, which is constant time. This means that no matter how large or small n is, the code will always run for the same amount of time, an example being simple math or a loop such as Notice how n is not referenced in this loop at all. Thus, no matter what the input n is, the loop will always run 100 times, which we call constant time, O of 1. Next, we have O of log n, which is called logarithmic time. Note that in computer science, a logarithm is usually log base 2 rather than 10. O of log n functions will typically look something like as follows. Note that I will take on the values 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. So I is growing exponentially. Thus, we can say that this loop will run approximately log base 2 of n times because the loop will run a number of times equal to the power of 2 that brings that value closest to n. Which sounds complicated, but here's a concrete example to show you what I mean. Let's say that n is 83 in this case. Then we know that our while loop will run until our index i is greater than or equal to 83. So i will start off as 1 then we, as we loop through, the current value of i will be multiplied by 2. So i goes from 1, then multiplied by 2 gives 2. Multiplying by 2 again gives 4, then 8, then 16, then 32, 64, and then 128. However, our value of 128 here is larger than our value, our n value of 83. So the while loop will stop here and does not run for i equals 128. Note that 64 is 2 to the 6th power, and our function ran a total of 7 times, which we can count here. So see, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so our function ran 7 times. And this makes sense because we got up to the 6th power, so it iterated 6 times plus this one more time at the beginning for i equals 1, which is technically 2 to the 0th power. Thus, we say that the function has a time complexity of O of log n, where essentially the number of times it ran is, equal to, is approximately equal to the power that we found here. It's also important to note that if i here, if i was being multiplied by, by 3 instead of 2, the complexity would still be O of log n. We don't need to report the log base in this situation because big O terms are kept generic, which is something we'll discuss more in the next section. All right, and then next up in our order is O of n, which is just, con which is just called linear time. This indicates the number of iterations your code runs through is directly proportional to n. 
So if n is 35, then your code will go through approximately 35 iterations. And this usually looks like this. So this is pretty straightforward. And then next up we have O of n log n. In 1301, this is most commonly seen as a nested loop, one of which is O of n time and the other of which is O of log n time, which will look something like For every one time that this loop here, this for loop runs, the while loop will run log n times. Thus, we multiply n and log n to get n log n because the while loop runs log n iterations every n times. And note that the function would also still be n log n, even if the, the log n function came outside and then the, the O of n function was on the inner loop. So the order of those doesn't matter. And then finally, we have O of n squared, which is called quadratic time. This means that the iterations your code runs through is the input n to the second power. We usually try to avoid a time complexity such as this one because it performs very poorly as n gets large. It may not seem like a big deal when n is a small number such as four, but if n was 1000, our code would have to run one million iterations before it completes, which could lead to timing out and a lot of other issues. Like lo n log n, this usually happens in a nested loop that looks something like this. The inner loop runs n times, this inner loop here, runs n times for every one iteration of the outer loop. And then because the outer loop also runs n times, we say that we have n iterations of this loop for every iteration of that one. And so with n iterations, we would end up with n times n, which gives us n squared. All right, and before we get to some examples, we have a couple important rules to make sure to remember while you're writing big O. Um, while we are determining the big O of some code, we want to simplify our complexities down to the simplest terms. This means that we only want to keep the largest term, which is our, considered our worst case, and we want to drop any coefficients that we may have. A good way to check your work is to make sure that the big O you end up with is as generic as possible and that your answer is of a similar format to one of the common big O types we discussed earlier. So as a quick example, let's say we have a big O, O of 3n squared plus O of 8,000n plus log n. So quickly going through this, we can quick, we can identify that n squared here, this is our worst n term. And so because of that, we don't really care about the other two because we know that at its worst, we can simplify this down to an n squared complexity. So we can get rid of these two. And so then we're left with O of three n squared. And then because coefficients don't matter, we can also slash out the three, which leaves us with O of n squared. Um, and another example we have, let's say we have O of 2n times 6,000n times 0.25n. So to save ourselves some math, let's go ahead and cross out those coefficients. Oops. So we end up with O of n times n times n. 
All right, and so we have to multiply the three of these together in order to get this big O down to its simplest form. So then we end up with O of N cubed, which even though it's not one of the common types we discussed above, O of N cubed is of a similar form to O of N squared, which is N to a power. So this is also considered okay. And then we have, let's say we have O of five. Well, there's no N in this term, so what do we do? We can technically say that O of five is the same as five times one, five being the coefficient. So then if we cross out the five and get rid of our coefficient, then we end up with O of one. All right, so now I have a couple examples that we can practice to get, um, a, to get a good idea of how to determine the big O of a loop. All right, while this may look really intimidating, it really helps to just break it down step by step and just go one loop at a time. So let's look at each loop individually and then combine their big O's afterward. So the first for loop we say is O of one, because notice how its range is 3000, which is not dependent on N. So this loop will always run 3000 times regardless of the value, regardless of the input that we put into it. The second is O of one third N. Notice how the range is from zero to N, but we have a step of three. This means that our index j only takes on every third value from 0 up to n. So we're effectively running n divided by 3 times. However, we always drop coefficients. So o of 1 third n just becomes o of n. And then this last one here, we, can, we say runs o of log base 4 of n times. because we have our k, which is being multiplied by four every single time. And so as such, it is the number of times that this loop will run is approximately equal to four to some power. So we know that the number of times this while loop will run is essentially whatever power brings four closest to our value of j. And because we want to keep it as generic as possible, we can essentially simplify this down to O of log n. Now that we have all three of our complexities, we can combine them as appropriate. So one thing to note is that whenever you have nested loops, you always multiply their complexities. So we end up with our overall big O of O of one times N times log N, which gives us N log N. Now for the second set of nested for loops. The first one runs n times, so it's O of n. It's important to remember that because the range function only takes in one argument, as shown here, the index starts at zero and goes up to, but does not include n. Thus, the first value of a is zero. So the first time this iterates, the inner loop will run zero times, and the number of times the inner loop runs will increase with a. Then, the last value of a is technically n minus 1, so b starts at 0 and goes up to but does not include the value n minus 1. So we can say that the values of b are 0, 1, blah, 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 up to n minus 2 because it doesn't include n minus 1. Because of this, we can say that on average, the inner loop runs 1 half n times. Thus, the big O of the entire loop is you end up with n times 1 half n, which gives O of 1 half n squared, which then equals O of n squared. All right, and then now we have the big O of both of these two loops um, together. And because these two loops are independent of each other within this function, we add their big O's instead of multiplying them. So we get, because this one is n log n, and this one is O of n squared, final, as a, we finalize it to o of, o of n log n plus n squared, which gives us O of n squared because you want to eliminate the lowest term and only keep the worst possible term of n. All right, and then for our next example, we have... This one is actually something of a trick question. 
Note the placement of the return statement. And remember that a function immediately exits as soon as it hits a return statement, even if it's in the middle of a loop. Thus, the loops will each only have, have time to run once before hitting the return statement. So this function is actually O of 1. No matter how large n is, each loop will only be on its first iteration once the loop hits the return statement for the first time and exits. Thus, the value of n doesn't actually affect the number of steps needed to evaluate this code. And that's it. Hopefully this helped to make Big O a little bit clearer, and thanks for watching.